And good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mad Barn Live. My name is Elisa, joined by Scott, the founder and CEO of Mad Barn, for another edition of um, Mad Barn Live. <laughs> Excellent. It's great to be here again, Elisa. Yep. Always fun and informative, as always. And nice to see so many people joining us so early today. You know, we kind of are new to this whole podcast thing. And so we wait to see a few of you showing up before we decide to put our mugs out on the air. But, you know, it's great to have uh, already so many people joining us. And we've already um, done a lot of uh, advertising for tonight's event to tell you what we're going to speak about this evening. So I'm sure a lot of you already have questions kind of ready to roll. But tonight's topic is Forge versus Green. And this is a pretty loaded topic, right, Scott? Yeah, it's yeah. a very low topic. I mean, <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, misconceptions of, you know, about what greens are. So I think here the stage is here to do some defining of terminology a little bit. Yeah. You know, just to, so everybody's clear, I guess, and on the same page. Okay. And so the way things will work, same as last time, the last couple of uh, episodes. And if you haven't joined us before, welcome. This is actually kind of a fun and informative session, and it is, uh, you know, on the fly. <laughs> so, and I'm operating the mouse tonight to get your questions up on the screen as they come in. But we want to talk first with Scott and get some answers to the questions that we've prepared for him. And then we'll open things up to the discussions and the questions that you might have as well. So Scott, first question. <laughs> this is this is a big one. What is grain? <laughs> well, it is a great question, honestly. So this is some of the terminology, I guess, nomenclature we want to make sure it's clear before we get going, because it's as simple as that sounds, what is grain? I think we all have this kind of idea of grain. But by a pure definition of what is grain, we usually refer to like the small seeds of things like wheat, barley, corn, rice, the, essentially the, the high starch uh, energy stored portion of the plant. Um, but then grain kind of starts to encompass a lot of different things. And it can be uh, like byproducts, for instance, are a big uh, component of course. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's, it's now it's like it's moved out of what we traditionally call a grain, but it's still a grain component. But it behaves very differently. In the digestive system uh, a little worse. And then with horse nutrition in particular, uh, grains would encompass like oil seeds, like soy, canola, flax, things like that, which don't have any really green starch or sugar to speak of. They're high in oil and protein. It's not classically what you would call a grain, again, oil seeds, or canola, but it, from a horse nutrition standpoint, it kind of falls into what we would typically call a grain. But then, <laughs> And not so much in North America, you find, but uh, we do use some of the grains as fodder, not so much the grains the whole plant uh, can be harvested. And so that would be like a grain for forbs. You know, depending on the stage of harvest, like it's you know, some of the wheat straw that we use after harvest, that is purely for it because the uh, grains can move. Uh, but you say in Europe and some places like that, they'll make overage. And so we do have the grain head still on there, depending on stage of maturity, we'll get how much starch will be in there. So we move from this kind of phase of uh, complete forage, just all forage, to you know almost a grain type forage if you can really let it mature. Guys, there's some audio issues. Oh, sorry, just here now. Right. Cool cool. So let's pull this closer so, again. You know what? This is this is really great. We were just talking about this, about how people can can. can <laughs> It's like when we just talked about before we started saying, could you imagine if we did the whole show and nobody could hear us? Yeah, well, it's turning it that way. So <laughs> Look at all these bad. people. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. Thank you for letting us know. That's really helpful. Okay, so we'll get a little closer to the microphone, especially you, buddy, because you're the one we want to hear from. So let's try and test you a little bit if you're a little closer to you. Let, let us know if you can hear it better. Yeah, like everybody's already told us. So. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not uh, going great. But, um, yeah. Well, game, and you know, game. a lot of this, unfortunately, has to do with weather, weather sometimes. Yeah. If you live in the Ontario area, then, or Ontario, the province of Ontario, it's especially really the for southern for Ontario region right now, we're getting a lot of really bad weather. That doesn't always help uh, with the, uh, with the signal sometimes. Oh, wait, it's better. We're testing things here. I think it's hey, hey it's Candace says it's better. I'm with you. It, it's better, Candace. It's the audio, better. not the mic. Okay. So, shall we back it up, then? Well, how would you like to do this? I think we just carry on. Okay. Well, sorry. I mean, Ms. Chavi, we can give a quick overview of yeah. Is this better now, I guess, is the question. Yeah. That one that's better. If, uh, if, 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 if you guys wouldn't mind out there just letting us know if you can hear Scott better, uh, that would be great. When I, you're going to have to talk a little. Oh, Nancy from Nova Scotia, can you hear Scott all right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just talk a little bit, Scott, see if they can pick that better. Yeah, so just coming back to the green conversation, so yes, a little bit better. Uh, Sounds like underwater. But I think the uh, 
How about now? Is that better? Uh, that's <laughs> still underwater. Not. That may just be my voice, actually. It makes it sound like I'm underwater. <laughs> Anyways, we can get on with this show. This will this be one for the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. You know the blue for real? This yeah, will go on there. This yeah. will be us, for sure. <laughs> this is excellent. <laughs> okay, let's go back to where we were. So we were asking Scott, you know, Oh, okay. Don't worry. I can hear. Now I hear a whole bunch of feedback coming back. It's okay. It's all good. Okay. See the button that's in the front here, button of the game? Yeah. And that's it. Change it. Okay. We're going to change try, try the audio a little bit. bit. See, now I think the problem is we've changed too many things. <laughs> all right. We'll give it a whirl at this stage. And we can hopefully fix some of this stuff, tweak some of this after the fact, too. But it's live. So we'll see what happens. All right. Go all ahead, Scott. We got it better. All right. So we're back to the topic of forge versus grain. The question I asked Scott right off the hop was, what is grain? And he went into some detailed explanation of all the different types of grains. So one of the first ones that you brought up was grain byproducts. Yep. So let's talk about that. Grain byproducts, what are they? Well, exactly what the name says, they're byproducts of grain. So a lot of grain we uh, harvest is used for animal uh, feed or human feed. Wheat uh, in particular, we go up human market a lot and we get a lot of byproducts off that like wheat mid shorts and some of the brands even uh from corn gets used for a lot of industrial purposes uh mainly making ethanol uh and then from that we get the byproduct called corn distillers grain which is a really nice product because all the starch has been removed so if you get it so you're talking about uh, metabolic horses actually you're any horse for that matter because you really don't want to feed a lot of starch or sugar which is what we'll kind of get into more and more uh in this conversation of grain versus forage so we get these distillers grains, which you know, kind of mid-range protein, uh, fat, and really still really bad. <laughs> yeah, but some people are okay. Okay. Some people are okay. All right. Um, sorry, and then the distillers grains be a byproduct, and things like soy hull. So again, the outside hull of the soybean is removed, and the meaty part is used for protein, and the oil that's in there gets separated and used again just for animal feed and then horse feed. But the soy hulls represent basically a fiber source. Um, even like beet pulp, for instance, is a byproduct of sugar production. Uh, it's the leftover fibers portion. These are all like sometimes people, uh, depending on what the ingredient is, uh, they'll knock them a little bit because they we call them byproducts. They are inexpensive, which actually is a great uh, feature of them. But they can be great additions to uh, a lot of horse feeds. Uh, and depending on what we're doing, um, another one, one that's become more popular is copper meal or coconut meal. Uh, it gets sold here. Again, it's fine products, it's basically the same thing. You've got a byproduct of coconut oil production that's just coming from overseas, because obviously <laughs> on the shores of uh, Canada, we don't have a lot of coconut trees. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's funny because some of those things that you get kind of almost this, uh, uh, like you become this mystique to them, like, oh, because they're coming from far away and it's not readily available here and it is more expensive, it becomes this, like, I don't want to call it mystical ingredient, but sort of. But at the end of the day, if you kind of like, you can tell this really good story about corn distillers, right? Like, they did like, all you know, from the fields of uh, here. We, we produced the finest quality vodka ever okay. produced, and from yeah. that, we had this byproduct. There's this, this great grain that's left over, and it's called corn distillers grain. It's a lot of it, but nobody markets distillers like that. They're just like, here, please take it from us. We're done with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Versus some of these other byproducts that are getting a lot of marketing push behind them, and they're like, oh, you should really use this. What it comes down to at the end of the day, it's uh, you know the purpose what are we going to use this for what's the purpose of the ingredient how does it digest where does it digest how does it digest and what is the what's going to absorb from it so that's a very kind of long way around the byproducts but byproducts do represent a significant um, energetic source for the horse that we really should and need to take advantage of not to get too far off track here we're only going to be here for an hour <laughs> hopefully but like you know when we talk about ruminant nutrition you know, there's a great upside for the world. You can take very uh, fibrous products and things that you can use for human nutrition in particular, uh, feed it to a cow, and they'll turn it into much, much more valuable uh, ingredients being milk and things like that. The horse is a bit like that in the sense that uh, they can take some of these lower quality products and they'll turn it into a higher quality product for itself. Not quite as good as a ruminant, but uh, still has the ability to do so. Nice. I'll have a pause for 30, 30 seconds. We're going to take a little. Quick break. 30 okay? seconds. Let's see if we can fix this audio problem and then we'll come back. So just sit tight, go grab a beer and then uh, <laughs> or a glass of wine, and we'll be back shortly.
right there. So, round two, we're back. Yeah, we're back. Is, it, is this better now? Sorry. Well, so this is kind of silly, but we, we are new to this whole thing, and we're trying to figure out these technical issues kind of as we go. But we're hearing from some people, you can hear me okay, but you can't hear Scott okay. He's the one you really need to hear because he's the expert here. So we're going to test this out again. Again, thanks, guys, for putting all your comments in because that really helps us much to know better. if you can hear it. And we're hearing now that it's much better. But that's the woman talking, okay? Yeah, is it so better with me talking So is it now? better with Scott talking? Um, do you want to, like, recite the alphabet to test this no, out? No, I, I think we can just get going. And, okay. Uh, okay. Again, uh, the feedback is great. We appreciate it. And uh, this, this will be our last day for our camera. Uh, <laughs> We'll do Mark Elman. Anybody, anybody else is uh, looking for a job? No, it's just joking, I'm joking. no, everybody's saying it's great. Everybody's saying it's great now. So uh, it's all fixed. So we'll start. What do you want to do? Do you want to start from the beginning? No, mm -hmm. I think it was, I think grains, uh, wheat, you know, barley, corn, that kind of stuff. Includes oil seeds. And that's like that. that is so. So what he's going back to is the question was what is grain, and then your your quick wrap up on that is exactly what you just said. Yeah, right. and then, yeah, so, I think, <laughs> and then, Which I so, recite, but I've forgotten already. We'll carry on, we'll, we'll carry on, because I'll probably wrap a bunch of this back into it anyways. Uh, okay, and then we were just talking about grain byproducts, which is, you know, uh, like you were just talking about that, how cows work a lot of things through their system and stuff like that, but like grain byproducts that we have used a lot here are the soy as an example. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Old halls. Old halls. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's okay. Great. I'm on. It's, all right. it's okay. Changing. I'm on. Sorry. I work here. Yeah. <laughs> it's the old halls. Sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that would be. Um, so just uh, actually, so you bring up a great point because, like, a lot of the the wheat mids. I think somebody put a question mark over what are wheat mids? Are wheat shorts we get called a lot of times. It's like the leftover portion after you put like no flour. So mm -hmm. when you're milling flour, for instance, what they're doing is just pure starch essentially. What they want. You know? Not doing the whole flour thing, but you want starch, and then all the leftover products the uh, from the hull portion will get ground up, and then they'll get sold as animal feed. Now, there's still significant nutritional value in those again, particularly for uh, horses or cows that uh, have significant fermentation capacity. So maybe like, we should even you know, back this up a little bit and talk a little digestive physiology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's okay. Um, some people, are, some people like it, so it's okay. We'll keep going. So, like, for for example, in a in a horse, like, take a step back further and go, you know, the main uh, carbohydrate that you want a horse to consume is cellulose, hemp cellulose, which is the fiber fraction, uh, and from that, they're gonna they can make their own glucose and uh, When we feed them grains, high starch grains, what happens is that gets absorbed in the small intestine. So you can digest the physiology wise, you have the small intestine. Uh, it can break down, it can absorb and break down sugars and starches. It can break down cellulose. Those reach the high gut. The high gut bacteria will ferment those. The horse will then drive it. And that's what we want. We want the high gut maximized before we ever consider uh, looking at adding any type of thing. Um, and then just somebody's put a comment up here. It's using so many commercial grain formulations. Uh, there's a reason for that. One, they're digestible, they're inexpensive. They kind of, you know, there's a bit of protein that you kind of fit the bill for everything in terms of when you do formulations. And I know that, again, people are like almost see this negative connotation to byproducts, but we really just need to spin it in a positive light. There's no reason for it's negative, but it should not use them. Because, right? right. again, you're making good use of a byproduct. It's not used in the human food chain. Uh, and it's very, a lot of times it's good for the horse. Right, but it gets a bad rep because people call it. Or sweepings, <laughs> right? And I hear that a lot, uh, just on the ads I hear on the radio, for example, for dog food, dog food, and they're they are <laughs> knocking, you know, that this is the, that they feed, the, they make the dog feed with the stuff that falls off, uh, on the ground, right? So it's, it's, it gets a bad rep as floor sweepings, but it's, it's not necessarily all bad. This no, stuff is good. It's used the right way. Used the right way. And I guess that's what, you know, the whole point of this book, talking about this is, if used appropriately. Now, talking about grains, for the vast majority of horses, we don't need any of this. Mm -hmm. Like, they just don't need it at all. So, I mean, although we're talking about, we say we can use it in commercial feed formulation for different things, uh, or feed it to horses, what we really want to do is optimize the horse's forage intake and treat time. So, let, like, again, let's get to this, like the whole crux of like the forage versus grain. 
like in how we feed a horse. We, we, you know, talked about this before, kind of the basics of horse nutrition is you want to optimize foraging intake because basically you want the horse chewing as much as possible. And so, like, if you look at uh, any type of grain, the horse can consume less of it quickly. The more fibrous the product is, the hay or pasture, the more time you have to spend chewing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a dry hay, for instance, would be up to three times as much chewing and saliva production as you get, let's say, a pellet or even a beef pulp, for instance. Uh, they just don't need to spend a lot of time chewing it. And so if you just think about the physical characteristics of what you're feeding that horse, and like, you essentially want to maximize um, eating time that horse. So we cover this in the nutrition side of things where that's the first selection factor when we're doing diets is, okay, how much energy does this horse need now? Ideally, you know, everybody should have a forage analysis and this is why, like, okay, does this forage need that requirement? Now, a lot of people, you have the forage, you can't change it. So you're like, okay, it doesn't. What's the next step in that uh, formulation process? And that's, again, you've got protein and energy. So sometimes this does have to come from grains. And these byproducts would be your first best choice, I right, think, right? uh, as opposed to um, certainly not a good point. So, these byproducts are my favorite choice. Back in the day, at least when I was a kid, uh, corn was something that you fed horses. Uh, for energy, number one, and uh, it was something you fed in the winter a lot, you know, especially yeah. because like, you fed that to the older horses, generally, uh, and you fed it to race horses for energy, but you're saying, no, corn is not necessary. Well, and again, there's a lot of reasons corn is unnecessary. Why we shouldn't be feeding it? One is just the genetics of corn, mm -hmm. uh, the selection of corn, so it's a grain. We, it, it's a very industrial uh, crop. Mm -hmm. and we use it for a lot of industrial purposes and animal feeds. And what we've done through the breeding of corn is made it less and less digestible, the starch portion. And so, from a horse standpoint, that's terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, like at that best, you know, back in the day, it was 70% digestibility in the small intestine, it dropped to, you know, probably like 55 60% yeah. starch digestibility. And so, what happens to that starch if it's not being absorbed in the small intestine? It's fermenting in the hindgut. And so, we lead to a whole range of problems dysbiosis, just hindgut acidosis, leaky gut, all these mm -hmm. types of different. Uh, and so it's better, you're better off just to stay away from okay, okay. corn altogether. But you're also making a point earlier too about how the horse chew because we need all this saliva. One thing we've, uh, I've learned certainly from being here is that a you know, horse produces, I think it's 50 gallons of saliva in a day, right? <laughs> but this is one of the most critical things when you're dealing with horse with ulcers, let's say, is that they need to be chewing and creating that saliva to help out with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, again, chewing is the number one way to get saliva production, uh, and saliva contains a significant amount of sodium fiber. So again, you see a lot of uh, antacids sold in the mm -hmm. horse market. Mm -hmm. Well, the best antacid is your horse's saliva. Right. It's getting them to chew more and more. Uh, no, not to, you just had a question today, of course, with slobbers. Uh, okay, for, yeah, for me yeah, and clover, yeah. you don't necessarily yeah. want that. That's that's too much. But right. uh, um, yeah, you know, making sure your horse has forage at all times, that it's not overly processed. So it's, we're going to get to this too. We talk about right now, actually. So, like things like Timothy pellets, alfalfa cubes, or yeah. Timothy cubes. You basically you mechanically process these already. So it's still a forage. You're still getting the hindgut fermentation, which is what you really want. You're not adding sugar and whatnot, but you're reducing chew time a lot because it's already been processed. Mm -hmm. And if you soak it, which again the benefits of soaking in the sense of okay, we want to increase water intake. But you're again, you're reducing the water time, the chew time even more, because the two things with chew time is essentially the chemical makeup or the physical makeup of the actual forage or the length of cut or something like that, and the saturation or the hydration of it. Because again, think about eating soda crackers. Right. You ever yeah. done the soda cracker challenge? Yeah, yeah. Eat five in a minute or whatever it is, mm -hmm. another glass of water. Well, it's the same thing with dry hay. The horse has to just sit there and chew and chew, and that right. just creates more and more saliva production uh, to help buffer. But even like you're saying, if you kind of think about this in, from a human standpoint, if I'm having, uh, you know, you know the revenge after eating something and, you know, my having heartburn and my stomach's bothering me, they do suggest you know, chewing gum because, again, you're creating saliva yourself yeah. to help heal yourself, right? You can take a ton, sure, but chewing gum is just as good, apparently. Yeah, uh, well, you don't need to give your horse chewing gum. No, but I'm just saying, like, it's that idea that you, you, you want your horse to produce more. 
survival. Yeah, absolutely. And again, so it comes back to the very essence of this, this whole forage versus green. So if we want to formulate a diet, we want to formulate it uh, forage first, always, mm -hmm. um, just to ensure that we are maximizing um, the horses, like optimizing the horses behavior to keep the buffer. Uh, you know, it always comes up that, uh, you know, ulcers is over and over again, right? And uh, it's probably the number one issue is just related around feeding behavior. And, just, uh, and like, even like sometimes, like, you're like, well, we do feed mostly forage, but then you find out, well, we don't have forage from 10 to right. 6 in the morning or something like that. And you're like, well, that's a significant amount of time to forage. Same thing, uh, loss of saliva production, just not true. And then they get into doing aberrant behaviors too. Right? No, but that's true. <laughs> that's true. I mean, if they don't have the ability, you can start chewing the salt, right? Eating and shaving, eating their own manure, all those sorts of things. Yeah, if you've ever rescued a horse before, uh, you know, I know I, I've done it a couple of times, uh, they'll, they'll eat anything, the rubber mats on the floor, anything, just to get something into them. So, yeah. It's um, not even, you know, it's funny. It's not even about them consuming, like, it, you know, yes, they want to eat something, but it's, it's the physical act of just eating. Mm -hmm. It seems they just have this innate dry, um, Horses in particular are just keep eating. And yeah. so if you do anything to kind of toward that or don't allow them, yeah, they find anything to do it all. <laughs> yeah, no, it, and like even think about they're all out there and they're acting crazy because it's raining out right now and, and they'll stop and then they eat, you know, like it's they it just it almost relaxes them, right? So okay, so okay, we've talked about that then. When would I add grain to a horse's diet then? Almost never. Honestly, okay. for the majority of people, um, I get, you know, we can kind of walk through this, try to do it systematically. For the vast majority of people, would never need, you should never need to add grain to your horse. But you diet. mean the vast majority, meaning the average backyard horse, right? The horse that's sitting out there not working that much, or do you mean a performance horse? No, I mean even performance horses. Like, if you look at some of the work out of Sweden, uh, they've done some great work there doing all forage diets mm -hmm. uh, to standard bred race horses, okay. and they have found essentially no loss in performance. Mm -hmm. Now, we can so this I guess we'll, we'll start from the bottom and work our way back up. Yeah. We're talking like high level performance sources here. There is a case here to maybe add some holes to this diet or have very digestible starch source to just improve glycogen resynthesis a little bit. Horses, uh, unlike humans, are a little bit slower at uh, glycogen resynthesis. So when they get depletion, it takes them a little longer than say humans, which is why you can't carb load horses. Like everybody's heard in humans, yeah. you know, like. Starve yourself with carbs for a while mm -hmm. before a big event and then eat all the pasta mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. Don't ever do that to a horse. It doesn't work, mm -hmm. first of all. Um, and so you can make the case there, but even even that is probably, that's about it. Honestly, yeah. that really, really high level uh, or like racing where you're like, you need to get back, you know, a week later and you need to, you need to recover and be rapid uh, would be case. Now, having said that, Obviously, lots more horses are getting than just those really level horses. But this is part of the reason we do this, mm -hmm. is hopefully to change some mindsets that no, they don't actually need this. And we can do it with forage only. Um, and so some great ways to go about this is as you move, as you know, if you're talking about this high performance horse, are things like alfalfa cubes and pellets. So yeah. now we, you know, if we're talking, of course, that's very high energy needs. We have the long stem hay or pasture, so we're eating that as much as possible. And then we add in uh, some of these things that they can eat more of and they can eat faster. So somebody's bringing up a great point here. So the hay here is very poor. So this, this is, we do run into this where, hey, we have really poor quality hay. And so, yes, now we may have to look at supplementation. We're going to go to the bottom right to the top here. Even with a maintenance horse, we, could, we have really poor quality hay and there are no other options. This is where the byproducts become great. And, you know, when you look at it, Look at what we recommend on a daily basis at nutritionist. Mm -hmm. It's ground flax, default, and oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're staying away essentially from these starchy sources mm -hmm. uh, and still making the high gut do all the work. Mm -hmm. And it would only be in rare cases where we'd say, um, okay, maybe some oats could be added to this. And that again would maybe be a high level performance source of really poor quality forage because you can actually starve the hind gut a little bit. So if you're missing some substrate fermentation, and I almost hesitate to talk about this because it's so rare that it happens, but it can where the hind gut starves a little bit of uh, carbohydrates, which is the inverse of what we always talk about. It's always like the word, you know, too much carbohydrate. 
we can put a little bit of oats in there or oats is always the best and i'll come back to this in a second a little bit of oats in there and that'll actually it's almost this like uh, additive effect it's not one plus one it's two anymore it's like one plus one is four if i just like a couple handfuls of oats added to it and it's just and that's mainly because yeah the bacteria are starting to get because the hay quality is so poor um, there's just not enough like you'll see this, in, especially in a lot of the metabolic courses where the really deep food quality is the food quality of the not looking great, even though, you know, that's what you want to start doing late. You, know, uh, you just, <clears throat> sometimes you need something just to spark behind it. Right. And with those sources, a lot of times, honestly, ground flax is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the fermentable carbohydrates in ground flax is enough to do that. Mm -hmm. But again, it's this is where nutrition is really in their <laughs> merit. It's, like, it's not about just doing the map of you know, how much copper and zinc goes in there. It is like looking at the carbohydrate fractions, the digestibilities, knowing that like when we look at a hay that's really dignified, and that's basically you know, become completely indigestible, even to the bacteria, that we are going to need to add things like uh, deep bulk ground flags. Or you hate somebody to put it up here, hay pellets. Um, yes, because you're generally when you're buying hay pellets, it's a consistent quality. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'll be a higher quality than you're really, really or in some cases, if uh, it can be um, alfalfa, if your horse can tolerate alfalfa, some metabolic horses you cannot right. seem to yeah, tolerate yeah. alfalfa at all. Uh, if Jenny's asking what type of oil would you mention that oil should be part of the diet as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, again, this comes back to where it's really, it's the whole, like, there's not one recommendation because, it, you know, I can say you could keep no oil you get from the grocery store. And if it's just a case of a few extra calories, that's all you need. It's absolutely yeah. fine. If you were talking like a high performance horse where they are feeding grain, well, you put some of that, like you get them off the grain, but you know, it's already high in omega-6, you definitely wouldn't want that. We'd say something more like flax oil. I mean, flax oil would always be the ideal, or uh, you know, if we have the product with the DHA in it, which would be really ideal in terms of getting the diacid profile mm -hmm. in there, um, those would be kind of the, the ideal ones. Yeah, and the most popular, right? Yeah. Um, Marilyn here, she's she's Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. I just put the wrong one. <laughs> um, Marilyn's actually a user of Navarty products, and she uses Omnady. Um, and that is actually one of the reasons that I use Omnady, too, is because the hay in Ontario is hit miss, I find. Especially in the winter, it, there's just really nothing that they're getting out of it. And the Omnady can help to get them to that level of what they're, from what they're lacking from their hay, what they're missing, the nutrients they're missing. Yeah, so I mean, when you're talking about hay quality, just to clarify, when you, when you talk about hay quality, it's usually, I mean, it's the energy and the protein content you're missing. So, I mean, it's not really providing that, it's providing the minerals and vitamins and year round, just to clear, clarify, year round, we're going to be short of minerals and vitamins. And, uh, particularly things like copper, zinc, iodine, selenium, it's a really good thing to balance. And that's really what you're is to cover that up. Uh, when you're getting into poor quality, it's, you know, energy and protein that you're looking to supplement. And then we will need some other things. Uh, to supplement, possibly supplement up. But again, like ideally, we spend a little more time managing where we can forage. And I know there's, we get uh, a lot of, I don't want to go like kick back, but there's a lot of like people saying, I don't have an option. This is all, and if you're in a boarding situation, that's totally true. Right? You, yeah, you don't have the option to go uh, get a different way. No, so no. then, then you do have to match things up. And sometimes, honestly, like uh, a bit of commercial feed is the easiest way to go. Wow. Again, you want to look for something. Um, things with fat and fiber, right, is the best way to go if you are going commercial feeds. If commercial feeds are tough uh, because they don't tell you how much starch and sugar they have in them. Okay, okay. So this, like, you'll see a lot of times they'll be like, oh, it, you know, it's high fat and fiber, low NSC. And like, what does low NSC mean? Well, it's lower than the one that's 50% NSC. You know, well, that's still not low. Like, you know, if this one's 25, that's still not low. Uh, so it's it's imperative you know what is actually in the feed and where to feed it, um, which is why we have that feed bank as well, to right. try to make, make sure everybody knows exactly what they're getting in the feed and different feeds. Okay, so Sherry did something that a lot of people are afraid to do, really, because some people are really afraid to go off the commercial grain route and go to the all forage diet. It scares a few people, right? Uh, but she switched her horse to a few years ago. Hey, Timothy, complete feuds. Alfalfa pellets, beef pulp, oil, salt, and of course, And but she, you know, but the reason I put this question up is because 
Um, so some people will say, like, oh, I'm afraid I'm just going to get skinny if I right. go to an all forage diet. But let's address that because we do we do get that as a question sometimes. Oh, I want to switch them, but I'm afraid it's going to lose weight. Yeah, and so I think what goes wrong here is the uh, it is doing it and how it's implemented. And again, this is why having a nutrition consultation with uh, somebody. Is so so important because like if you take a horse and you say you feed two three pounds and bring their kilos and they're just on a mid quality hay and you go and just put them all onto a low quality hay well of course that's going to cause problems because they're not driving up energy now if you put them on a decent quality like even just an average quality hay they'll be more than fine to transition and again the transition does take time like you usually if you look at from switching forages and you go from one hay to another. You're looking at approximately six weeks for the microbiome, or that you know, the bacterial protozoal population in the hind gut to adjust to that change. So six weeks, and that's a long time for these adjustments that occur. So if you're on a grain diet or feeding any amount of grain and you want to get rid of it, well, you need to factor in this into the transitional period. And I mean, it's some of this is just basic kind of arithmetic where you want to make sure the calories in are still matched up. So if you feel horses spending 25 megacals a day. Well, whatever it's coming from before, it better be providing 25 megacalories. Now, lots of forages can, uh, some who won't. And so that's where the hay tests come in. So I saw somebody ask, uh, do we do hay tests? <laughs> like, so we don't actually like uh, do the hay tests. We're facilitating it, though. Actually, we're putting a program together where we'll facilitate it. Um, get it out to a lot for you to uh, just to ease the work load and make it easier. What we do is take your hay uh, samples and results and give you a very good diet, a very complete diet, by the way, and these guidance on how to go to an all forage diet, how to get the best uh, diet. And in the meantime, when you're waiting for that service to come from NAPA, if you go on the website, uh, there is an article there. If you just go to that um, it's Megafine lens and you talk about the importer and take a hay testing, an article will pop up. It'll give you all different places where you can send your hay to be tested if you happen to live in, in Canada. And yeah. so for our American friends, we don't necessarily have it there, but well, I'm sure you can ask and find out, right? Yeah, you yeah. Great, awesome. So we got them covered too. But yeah, we don't do it here, but we do provide you with a list of different labs where you can send it off to. And I think we have some video that's going to be coming out uh, shortly if it isn't out already uh, with some of our um, different uh, nutritionists showing you how to take it. Yeah, actually, that one's out. Uh, I mean, posted. But yeah, so just again, because this does come up as well, like taking hay samples with a forage probe, a lot of don't have access to a forage probe. There are ways to do it without it, just in terms of grab samples and uh, paper pair of scissors. You can do that as well. Right. Um, so, so, Rebecca here has made a comment about her off the track throwback, because this is another area, we see this all the time where it comes in, you know, like uh, off the track throwback. And everybody, of course, thinks they need to gain weight. And then you get a lot of like, there's no way we could do this on an all forage diet. Again, back to my earlier comment about changes and transition when you consider the life of a thoroughbred that's on the track and what they're eating. And again, this needs to change as well. Um, the, the way we feed those horses, but when, one thing at a time, I guess. <laughs> So you're gonna, there's gonna be a big adjustment period where you need to bring them down on the grain. You gotta adjust. So ideally, what you're doing in that situation is you are sourcing a very high quality forage for that horse because they, they are gonna be coming down on the track and have a high good metabolism. Um, you're probably on the other side, possibly still growing. Uh, the other thing is realistic expectations. You do not want to put weight too fast onto a horse. Uh, Particularly, you know, going from this workload down to another, I was just reading an article about uh, insulin sensitivity and how exercise increases insulin, insulin sensitivity so quickly. But the reverse of that is when you stop exercising, only think for five to 10 days, and that effect starts to fall off very rapidly. So you consider a horse, uh, you know, working pretty hard every single day, and then we move it into an environment where it's not anymore. Uh, you, you don't want to find a lot of calories to it because now we're going to have like blood glucose is going up, insulin going up, and we're going to predispose them to other issues possibly down the road. It may not be immediately uh, that you see some of those issues, but you, you know, two or three years down the road, the excessive caloric intake, particularly from starches and sugars, uh, will ultimately lead to like metabolic syndrome, which we're just seeing an increase in 
year over year uh, of this, uh, which again is part of why we do this, just to raise awareness. So again, realistic expectations of putting weight on a horse. Uh, you don't want to do it too fast, uh, and then slowly moving to with all blood side is absolutely feasible. And of course, the fat supplement is going to help a lot, and, uh, particularly again if we come back to say the very low quality forages, uh, dry hay. That supplement would be a huge benefit. Uh, some of these horses that are on really low quality hay, we're trying to go on the opposite end of the spectrum here, keep weight off these horses. Uh, they can start looking a little dull. Yeah. And but you look at the hay analysis, and you know it may be less than two percent full of fat. And so the fat intake of that horse is really, really low. And we all need fat, not as much as probably I have on me, but we all need some level of fat in our diet to cellular function and everything else. It's absolutely necessary. So sometimes on these really poor quality forages even 60 to 100 mils of extra oil can really help a horse blossom without having to worry about excess weight being there. And that's why you take yourself to try that first six months to the first year to kind of go through a plumping stage because they're they're changing their muscle makeup. Yeah. And so you have to be careful that the muscle that has the racetrack and they're developing these new muscles off the racetrack and they're new dogs. So right. for example, you know, I know it needs to be in my life, my guy, you know, he went from being a long distance uh, road horse to a hunter, and you know, you know, to develop that neck and that shoulder and that hind end power, but it took a long time. So you have to be patient with them when you take them off the track. They don't just switch from a greyhound to a show dog, you know, the, the next day, right? So be so, patient and, and certainly pretty uh, good feet. But you bring up a great point. I think this is this is extremely important. Uh, is the uh, identification of Fat from muscle. <laughs> uh, because sometimes, like, we start rounding these horses out and they're like, oh, they're really muscling up. And you're like, oh, are they getting fat? Well, you know, and this idea, I guess, too, that I'm going to careful to say here, but uh, this idea of rib coverage mm -hmm. in horses where they're like, well, I can still see those ribs. And like, that's ideal, that's actually, yeah. to yeah. actually see a good, like, clearly see some rib on the horse. Mm -hmm. now, I probably get that with a lot of people here, but. No, no, uh, no, 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 because even people who, let's say, are watching today, are really that educated in horses, um, or if you've been watching from the home on the app. So take your dog to the vet, you take your cat to the vet, they give you a, a skeleton, oh, sorry, a, um, a, a, an assessment, right? right. Of, of if your dog is obese or perfectly or below the but they do want to see just a little bit of rib. Yeah. So, you know, I have Jack Russell, I think he's in excellent shape, but my vet said, I think it is too much. So, you know, you, you, you kind of, you, you do want them. If you want to see some, yeah, and it's absolutely. that idea that we have to have a little cover and make fat to look like warm bugs, and they don't need <laughs> <laughs> No, and I honestly, it's not, uh, it's much healthier to have them a little on the inside, quite frankly. Uh, right for their legs, yeah, just yeah. everything. I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, how often does a horse, uh, horse's diet need to be reassessed? Good question. Uh, anytime like you make a forage change, ideally, uh. Now, that becomes unrealistic mm -hmm. when people are like, oh, flip flop and forages all the time. Which, I mean, again, we talked about this before. Like, the horse is an amazing, amazing biological buffer. So, like, if you go from a low quality hay to high quality hay, yeah, it's not amazing for the hind gut in terms of containment, but there is buffering capacity there. And so, you may be losing a little, a little weight for a while. And maybe losing weight. What you really want to make sure is that, one, we have adequate protein uh, and the mineral of life. Which is the big one because again, it really, even on a high quality hay, you're still going to be deficient in minerals. Uh, particularly the trace minerals in copper, uh, selenium, for most parts, depending on it's selenium in some parts of the country. Be bad, but, uh, so to reassess it, honestly, uh, like say twice a year as kind of a as a good barometer. If not, if there's no major if things are fairly fairly static. Twice a year is probably lots, or even once a year, yeah. things are fairly static. You know, yeah, you're getting maybe the same. It's the same field, all that stuff. Yeah, it's changing. Now, uh, here's where I would interject uh, like, to say, okay, well, like, first things first, like if something's going wrong, like if something's changed with your horse, whether it's behavior, uh, body condition, uh, just the way it looks, mm -hmm. and just you're like, oh, this is a, then I would absolutely be okay. Let's, let's, let's do a diet evaluation here. Um, or like, if you haven't been doing it, so this is where I, doing them regularly is ideal because you're like, you do want to. Identify the diet where this might be the cause. 
Kate's asking suggestions for horses that have been available but wasted. It's the most annoying thing in the world uh, for those of us who have to clean the stalls and for those of us who pay for the hay because you're paying a lot of money for hay right now. And you know, the last thing you want to be doing is throwing most of it out into the manure pile the next day. So uh, number one, slow feed hay. That's that's my that's my first go to there. Uh, don't put do not put it on the ground. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's multiple, like, slow hay feed nets are outside, they have the uh, different ones that basically put a hay net on top of it again, or ways to it. I mean, one of the issues with, like, particularly with uh, hays, is you can get into such low quality hays that they're just not valid, and maybe weeds, dust, or just the species of plant that are in there, uh, there's just, you know, horses like, well, I mean, if plus you just not eat it all. Like, now, the nice thing is, if you're wasting it, you're probably giving them enough that they have that ability. And I'm not going to tell you to feed last because I'm never going to tell you to do that. Maybe go to the hay net settings. Or um, even like things like you could spray a bit of oil on it. The backpack yes. sprayer yeah. mm -hmm. uh, will knock down the dust, uh, it'll change the palatability a little bit, soften up a little Or you can even just try it like uh, like soap and yeah. water. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in the bucket soaking away if it's not necessary. It could just be a light spray, but moisten it up, you know, cover up some of the dust. Maybe and if, if this is the worst Kate's talking about that's in a profile picture, he's not he's not he's not missing anything. <laughs> he's, he, he looks, looks great. really good. Yeah, yeah. So she I obviously I mean what she's wanting is to is to waste less uh, in that scenario. I think we need good strategies for doing that. Okay, so hold on here. Let's go to this one. This is actually a good question. A local nutritionist nutritionist recommended adding soybean meal to our forage diets. How do you feel about soybean meal? Again, only if it was necessary. It really, like soybean meal is fine. It's a great protein source. It's one of the highest quality protein sources you can get from plant based uh, for animal feed or just a plant based protein source. Uh, a question like if you're already feeding a bit of alfalfa and the hay is decent quality, you probably don't eat it here. Again, you don't want to feed excessive amounts of protein to horses eat it. If they're indoors, it creates excessive ammonia in the barn, which then leads to respiratory problems. Uh, you definitely don't want that. And honestly, it's just wasteful uh, in terms of feeding it. Now, if for whatever reason you think they're low on protein, uh, it's, it's certainly a great addition. But I am always wary of ad hoc recommendations without having to kind of analyze the entirety of the diet to do anything. Uh, which is like a lot of people get frustrated when they ask me like, direct questions say, oh, should I feed this to the horse? The question is, I don't know. Like, right. You need to analyze the whole diet. You need to look at what your horse is doing. It's not something you just say, yes, add it or don't add it. Um, it's a bit like uh, a lot of people are like, oh, I want to add amino acids to add top line. Well, do you really need to add amino acids to improve the top line? Or does the horse just need to work, more, work differently? Or uh, you know, there's some other reason top line to Well, and people are heavily influenced by others in their farm. If they're using something that, that works, for example, uh, on their horse, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work on yours. But they, you know, horses, the horses in the business of feeding horses is still trendy, right? For so sure. if something's in, everybody wants to get, to get in on that, yeah. whether the horse needs it or not. Sometimes. So, and I mean, I have a particular, I like talking about cognitive biases, reading about it, <laughs> and stuff like that. And I really, uh, I struggle with the idea of, well, they did this and this was the outcome, or uh, I think I've talked about this before where people say nothing else changed, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, this, so it must be the supplement X mm -hmm. or whatever it caused it. And you're like, no, I don't think that's true. Um, I, I, I do understand people are like, well, it was my experience, and I get that, but uh, I, I just, I'm very wary all the time of those kind of, um, I guess, uh, the idea that, oh, yeah, we did this and we saw this result, particularly sometimes it's a very short window. Like that's heavy on like that's actually the case you know, sometimes. So I, I really like some scientific rigor. And I mean that's why I love our team is like uh, sit down and make sure you got all the data before uh, making any recommendations or making any uh, grand declarations of what works and what doesn't work. Okay, we actually have a good question here. It's called and it is about one of our products, but this is <laughs> one that we get a lot of phone calls about is people talking and asking about three meals. So Jen's just asking you know, Give us a link, just a little short <laughs> explanation, <laughs> if you can, of why you would feed three meals. You know, what works is it with it? So, again, the product's just the three limiting amino acids, lysine, methionine, and threonine, um, that you would typically find in any horse diet or any plant based diet, quite frankly, with you know, horses. Uh, now, so if you're on a really low quality hay, 
would be a good idea to do that. Um, if when we get into more like, really high performance sources, we really want to fine tune uh, the protein because I mean, in those cases, you definitely don't want to overfeed protein. You want them to like, optimize uh, protein because you don't want those sources using protein for energy. So you want to get right on the mark. It becomes a great situation to keep that. Um, so it's not really the type of horse, it's more the diet mm -hmm. uh, and what the diet looks like. What so let's go back to the beginning here, just for those of you, because I know we've had some issues today with audio, and thanks for sticking with us tonight, everybody, and <laughs> letting us get through these little hiccups. But if you want to have this done, if you have not had this done, this is something that we do provide here at Navar, and you know, it's um, it's good. <laughs> so to, to, to have your diet analyzed, or sorry, to have your diet analyzed, to have your hay, uh, the test to send us back the hay analysis and we'll help you out with that too. But um, if you want to do that, it's as simple as going on to the website, Canada, it's madburn.ca, America, it's madburn.com, uh, and clicking the animals diet button. What I always tell people is when they're calling me and they want my heart to let be as specific as possible. Give us the weights of the products <laughs> that you're using, right? Because by saying some people say, well, I feed uh, a scoop. Well, we don't really know what the scoop size is. so. You know, weighing the feed, that type of thing really does help. Send the hay analysis in. If you have blood work that's been done on the horse, you're great. Confirmation shots, recent confirmation. Not shots of his face in the stall, a shot of his whole body so that we can see what he looks like because we're not able to physically get there and, and see it. The more information you give us, the better we can do when we provide you with your evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the old adage of, uh, you know, you get good data in, you can get good data out of versus uh, which we definitely don't want to do. Now, the great thing is, that even if you don't have a forage analysis, um, we do have a massive feed bank of forages where we can like, at least get relatively close. And actually, there was somebody online that they saying, well, you can't do just averages. Um, I somewhat disagree because we can get surprisingly close. We've done testing before where you're like, you do the actual analysis, like you do a diet evaluation based on our, uh, just the, not having the actual hay analysis, and then you can take the actual hay analysis and compare and say, okay, how far off were we? And we get surprisingly close uh, a lot of the time, just given the experience and just the, how large the database is we're working from. I was talking to a data scientist the other day, actually at a book conference of all places, and uh, we were talking about the diet analysis, and I was you know, referring to some of the data, I was like, ah, I didn't know that's not that clean. In certain areas, and I said, but one of the nice things is when you get to these numbers, these huge numbers, it kind of cleans itself up, uh, it tightens up a little bit just because you have so much data to work on, uh, which is one of the great things about doing the diet evaluations. Is we, you know, not to get into the model stuff tonight, but you get to, you, the nutrition model becomes more and more robust mm -hmm. over time. Uh, so it's yeah, it, it, it's definitely worthwhile to do it and go through the process. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't have a portion, but we still encourage people. I mean, it's really it's still 50 bucks, 40, 50 bucks at the end of the day to do it. And it really allows us to kind of do this work first meeting and ensure that like, we absolutely optimize for it. You take chewing time for the horse and put the very best diet from it. Because it's honestly, it's as much about the uh, behavior, psychological well being of the horse as it is the kind of. And really, the truth is, you know, it's not a computer that's doing, it's just spitting this out. <laughs> These are actually human beings, real, <laughs> real people back there who are putting together uh, these diet evaluations for you. And what's the, what are the other great things about that is, like I say to people, once once they send you back the, the, the current diet and recommended diet, uh, you have a nutritionist that understands your horse and is available for you at any point. Right, so you can develop a relationship with your uh, nutritionist here at Mad Barn, and like I say, you come back to me six months from the. We love getting before and after pictures. We've seen a few of them this week that have been really well, great. We have a whole cork board over us. We do, <laughs> we do, um, and I always suggest that to people too. If you're using uh, or trying our products or you're doing the evaluation, take a picture of your horse before. Take another picture of your horse maybe oh, three weeks, a month from now, then another one a couple of months after that. Because you see the horse every day, you don't often see the change as yeah. as much as we do when we look back and forth, you know, and just see that you can see that change even 
know it's settled. You can see it sometimes within a month. Uh, so yeah, definitely, um, definitely you would get to take those pictures. Uh, here's another one here. Okay, actually, let's do this one too, Scott. Touch on the difference between Omni and, and Amino Trace and what to consider when choosing between the two. Again, not to uh, broken record this, but again, the diet evaluation would be a great place to start in terms of picking between the two, but just to answer your question, uh, the difference between the two really is uh, magne magnesium level, the amino acid level, zinc, copper, and the natural source of vitamin E uh, are what are in the, in the amino traits. Uh, and it was really formulated for uh, like IR horses, metabolic horses, although it can be used for any horse, uh, just not to just uh, insulin resistant horses, uh, but to overcome high iron intake, which is pre prevalent everywhere. Honestly, like, uh, horses consume more than enough iron in the diet. I know we've talked about this lots before. Do not add products that have added iron to your horse's diet. It's completely unnecessary. Uh, and in, in, in fact, wait, a lot of times it's harmful uh, or it can be detrimental. Um, so that's what the amino chase was there for. Um, Omnity again was balanced off like using an array of forages to kind of balance this, like, you can see about that. I think I'm concerned to say 95, honestly, it's probably closer to 98, 99% of the diets. It will do a really good job of balancing them out. Um, again, it's just slightly lower levels of amino acids and amino copper, still more than enough to uh, optimize those levels. Uh, and so generally, we ought, like, on any is the go-to recommendation. One, it's less expensive. Uh, in certain cases, again, where if you have particularly high iron A or particularly low uh, Protein maybe because amino acids are high and amino trace will tend to shift over there. Or really metabolically sensitive horses uh, will go that way as well. But for the vast majority of horses, on maybe it's the one that All right, I think uh, we're going to oh, let me operate this mouse. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I think we'll wrap it up there, but you want to put a little on today's so, discussion? I will just repeat this because it's yeah. important. Somebody asked me what not to add to the diet <laughs> <laughs> is iron. So like, and you can look on the ingredients and uh, anything. So there's a big difference between iron on a guaranteed analysis because there's iron in everything essentially and what we call added iron. And what you need to do is look at the ingredient list and look for things like ferrous sulfate, ferrous being iron, or iron oxide added in the ingredient list. And those are things you particularly uh, there will always be iron in everything, uh, but you just want to add, which is why we don't need to add the extra. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that's, no, that's, that's great. And like I say, for, for those of you uh, who have, I see a couple of other questions that popped up, fecal water syndrome, uh, one of the fecal water syndrome, again, really easy. Right onto the map on the website, you go to that magnifying lens, type in fecal water syndrome, it's right there for you. Right, so yeah, really, there is a great there is a great blog post on really uh, water syndrome. It's something you get asked a lot about. So go on to the website and, and uh, pull up that information there. It's a great tool, the Mad Garden website, especially the blogs, the articles that are written. They're not just written by someone in you know, you know sitting in their in their garage. They're they're done by veterinarians, by nutritionists, you know, by, by people who put some science into this stuff. So as usual. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, I guess. Yeah, hopefully. If he's uh, not busy. This guy is really busy. I do want to, so we got a few minutes here. Okay. We still got a few people on. I, just, I get so much pushback from other boards when I go to forage-based. Okay. And I was actually in admin on, uh, I think it's called forage. I can't remember the name of the group. Um, it's just, um, it's a good, it'd be great to spend all my time yeah, to, to help people out and answer questions. But... Uh, it, it always blows me away when people are like, you can't go the forage only. I don't know how much research you have to see or how many professionals need to tell you. And I guess, you know, maybe part of the problem is there are some professions that they would still say, no, I can't do any. Um, which, again, it's been proven time again, you really don't. And people have had, you know, there's all, you can always find somebody. Uh, I didn't say I had a bad experience with it, or my horse lost weight. And I'll just, Reiterate, it probably wasn't that popular. Uh, but even horses that are losing their teeth, you can still use a forage base um, to meet their nutrient requirements. Now, you, can, you may have to do a little bit of supplementation, uh, but again, this is where the nutritionists are so valuable. Uh, this is where the $100 uh, is to be able to really look at a diet. So, here is the optimum for your horse, your situation. Uh, that gives that personal touch to balance.
balancing approach is that it is really easy. And you know, that's part of the boarding party too, right? Ellen. You know, I mean, you're a boarding party, and you have a thousand different opinions in there, <laughs> and you've got to stick with your guns. That's the way I kind of go. That's the way I think it's it's my horse, right? It's yeah. your horse, Ellen. So you get to make that call. Uh, but yeah, I agree. There was another comment really about it. Somebody saying, "Yeah, I, the, the peer pressure and the party can be really strong," and it's true. You know, because just because I used it, and I, I don't need to harp on it and push it to all of you, right? Uh, it's your horse, so you get to make those decisions. Actually, I just do, I do want to address something. This is uh, somebody brought up a question at the bottom. Sorry, uh, about creating labels and having to feed so much. Um, this so again, we're not a proponent of feeding grain, but I do want to clear the air a little bit on these green labels. Some of this is actually just regulatory. So how they get formulated, it's almost like um, they have to be formulated to that. The feeding directions are such that they have to. Uh, put those on so basically i mean there's so many different versions of commercial feeds we're, we call complete feeds you should just do the whole session on this mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um and so when you have a complete feed they all kind of hit the same levels and you can look at the selenium level on the tag that's the telltale it'll be from point zero point three to zero point six that's a complete feed or by by commercial feed company well you have to feed three to five kilos to hit the minimum selenium level that meets requirements and so they have to write on the label Three, three, five, you know, three to five kilos, six to the twelve pounds uh, for nine units, and that's regulated. So I really think, again, I'm not one to defend uh, feeding concentrates or grains, but it's, I mean, that's why it's like that. So I mean, if you want to get angry at somebody about the labels, talk to your regulator, to your FDA, USDA, and your CFIA, because they're the ones that are, you know, that's the way. Now there are changes, but like anything, uh, government, it's going to be slow. That takes time, but um, so again, you know, there are times and there are instances where we'll say, like on the senior feed, an older horse, we're like, yeah, you can continue to use that senior feed, that's a fine choice, and then we'll supplement it with minerals and vitamins because that's what needs to get boosted mm -hmm. is the mineral and vitamin concentration. Mm -hmm. So, a lot, and we see this in boarding barns all the time. You'll have maybe two, three complete feeds you can pick from, mm -hmm. but you're never going to feed enough to meet the mineral environment requirements for 99% of horses. Nor should you, nor should you be feeding that much grain to that horse. But you do need to fortify the minerals and vitamins because there won't be enough minerals and vitamins in that community to meet that horse's requirement. I thought it's much lower than the other. Uh, so, and I do, uh, anyways, we'll, we'll write an article on labels and probably cover all of that at some point in time. I don't think this is a podcast, but I hope that's it. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come up numerous times in terms of yeah, discussing. Exactly, exactly. Jenny, she's asking about probiotics. We talked about probiotics actually, Jenny, on our last um, podcast, I believe we talked about that. And so important to note, all these are safe. If you know, if we can retweet the beginning of the audio here and fix that and get it out there, we'll get it out there, you know, revised. Uh, but these are all saved, they're available for you on some of your uh, podcast apps, like all obviously available on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Instagram, those places as well. So we save these. You can go back and watch them. Hopefully, you can tweet the audio in the beginning for, for today's session. Just a voiceover? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, so you try to match up the lip movements? Yeah. Yeah. It may be time to go. <laughs> it's 8 o'clock, right on the button. Time to go. So thanks again for joining us. Back again in a couple of weeks, depending on Scott's availability. Uh, you know, we wanted to be here with you last week, but he was out speaking at a, at a Party, uh, event, so which which you do quite a lot. Yeah, actually, well, now well, we had to take a two-year hiatus from that. But, yes, uh, but it's nice to be back again. Yeah. Really, it's nice to see people again. I was at the uh, yearly sale yesterday in London. And it's just so great to be in a room like with all sorts of people, and it was the first time they were able to have that yearly sale in two years. So you know, nice to be in person, right? So nice to be able to do that and uh, make it like six million in sales total. I think. And we had a chance to talk to some of those uh, trainers and uh, vets and, and people that are in a pretty big deal here in, you, in our industry as far as the standard. I'm going to make you stay like two minutes longer. If oh, Julia yeah, no, came no. on here, okay. I feel oh, like she's late. Okay. Yeah, she's late, but we're going we're gonna to answer the question. It's very sport-based, right. and that's what we're talking okay. about. Uh, You're the last one of the night, Julia. So, because this brings up a great point. What, uh, what happens when horses turn out of the spring, summer, grass, and how do we assess quality and quantity? reduce forage. One, I would never say reduce forage like in terms of 
Uh, what's if you're turning them out and bringing them back in? Uh, you're going to go availability. You want availability all the time, right? particularly when they're inside. You really don't have anything else to do. So you want them to move. Um, anytime you're putting them out in the spring grass, obviously slowly. Uh, doing assessments, scissor clips are honestly a great way to do it because just standing there looking. Uh, a lot of times you can get fooled that there's quite an abundance of it, or sometimes you're like, oh, it looks a little thin, and it's actually there's quite a bit more than you realize, which is, you know, you can run into a lot of problems um, if there's, you know, they're consuming too much, particularly in the spring when you're first putting it back on, coming back to that whole six weeks to, for the microbiome to adjust. You know, if you go from dry hay, it's going to be quite low in sugars. Uh, Around the spring pasture, which is usually low dose sugar. This is why horses love it. I mean, that's why you see the blossom too sometimes. The digestibility of uh, the pastures would be much higher. The protein levels are going to be much higher, upwards of 20% on a dry matter basis. So I think people sometimes forget like, how much protein they can be on the mm -hmm. spring grass. Yeah. That's why they call it Dr. Green. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which can wreck habit on the hind gut as well. So again, they call it Dr. Green, but at the same time, you can go wrong and end up seeing, you can see the doctor. <laughs> By introducing it too quickly, but to assess the quality, obviously scissor clippings. You can just uh, you make a rectangle, you drop it, you clip it out with basically the set of clippers at even height, weigh it, see how much is in there. You do that two or three times. I'll give you an idea, and then you can actually send those samples off uh, for analysis if you really want to get into it. Like it's in the pasture. One caveat with uh, sampling pasture is that if you're gonna if you're interested in the sugar content in particular. And even some of the protein, more, more the sugar, you need to freeze the sample like, right away. Uh, you basically, you have a living organism, essentially the grass, plus all the uh, bacteria that are on the grass, and it will start to ferment almost immediately. Anybody's taking pasture samples and put them into a Ziploc bag, they've seen it bog up almost immediately. I mean, things are still, there's respiration going on. And what will happen over time is your, these bacteria will essentially do what happens in the hind of the horse. They'll start eating all those sugars and they'll convert them into terpene fatty acids or volatile fatty acids. You won't get a true picture of how much sugar is actually in your pasture. Uh, you get a very, we just won't get an accurate picture, let's say. So you want it frozen, you want it frozen all the way to the lab. Or if you have the ability to dry it at your facility, wow. <laughs> you can dry it. I mean, you can do it in a microwave. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> you'll, uh, yeah, you won't like the smell in your house no. if you do it in the microwave, but uh, it, it is an option to get yourself to try to freezing it or if, if you're just looking at if you're just looking at quantity, uh, scissor clippings with a set square. That's, that's, cool. that's cool. Well, I think that's great. Um, Julia, I hope that answers your question. You were the last one of the night tonight. We've got them all covered. Scott. We really, we really do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Because the whole first half was just people saying, "I can't hear you." <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, we that. hopefully we did and hopefully we'll see you all again in another couple of weeks for another edition of Mad Farm Live. I'm Lisa, this is Scott. Good night. Thank you.